What is I get text? Hello, I'd like to call our meeting to order. Welcome to everyone. And I would like to welcome our SHS Academia group and ask you to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And we will start with approval of our agenda. I make a motion to approve the agenda. I'll second. Move and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor. Aye. 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 That motion passes, and we're going to go straight on to our presentation by the academic decathlon students from San Juan High School. Welcome. Thank you. With their fearless leader, Donna, welcome. Thank you. I would like to uh, let the board know and thank and congratulate uh, Donna Stockman. Over almost 40 years, right at almost 40 years in public education. And uh, she has been a French teacher, Akadeka, Humanities. She has helped out at Sanborn High School. I worked with her uh, for eight, well, several years when I was a counselor and a principal. And she is retiring this year. The last year, Ak the first year that Akadeka has ever made it to nationals and place, and her last year. And she's handing it off to Becky Hay, who will be <coughs> taking over in very good standing. So much appreciation to Donna for all her years. <laughs> so I am Donna Stockman and I have been coaching the academic decathlon team for eight years now. Took over from Mary Bird who also did great things with the kids. And this year we studied the American Revolution and a new nation was the, was the name of the team. All right, um, I'm Noah Darren and this will be my third year on the team. And basically how Akadeka works uh, on a team scale is that we have three divisions called uh, honors at the top and scholastic and then varsity and they're separated by GPA. So 3.8 to 4.0 is for honors, 3.2 to 3.79 and then below 3.2 is for our varsity division. And then so a team is three from each division and a school can have multiple team, our teams, our school had up to three teams. And um, the team's score consists of the two highest scores from each division. So, that, and that's how we decide who, uh, how our scores are. Indeed. So, kind of how academic. Oh, my name is Stella Haig. I this will be my third year on the team, and kind of how academic decathlon competitions are organized. We have ten events. So, seven of those events are um, objective testing events, and. They're consistent every year. So we have music, art, literature, social science, science, economics, and mathematics. And then they're all 50 questions and take a half an hour each. And then we have our three subjective events, so essay, <coughs> interview, and speech. And you do a prepared speech of three and a half minutes to four minutes. And then you do an impromptu, which is one to one and a half, or one and a half to two. And then our last kind of like add-on event is, sup is like super quiz. So it's kind of like a team relay event. So Every division gets to, like, how many questions is it? 12, and then so each, like, division answers 12 questions, and then whichever team that, so each team consists of all three divisions, and then whichever team gets the most wins. <coughs> so, uh, just quickly, they do a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, we hit all 20 national standards in economics, 11 of the 12 for ELA. Five content areas for math, four national standards for music, four for visual arts. We get two in life science, five of the seven in next generation science, which as a non-science teacher, I don't know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> and then in social studies, they hit seven of the ten themes that are mandated by the national standards. Wow. Lots of learning going on. Um, my name is Annalise Mullen. This will also be my third year on the team. And the North Idaho Competition of Excellence is our first meet of the season, the nice meet as we call it. Um, this season we had 27 of our Sanborn High School students participate. 
with 14 in honors, 9 in spastic, and 4 in varsity. Five of our teams placed in 1st, 2nd, 4th, 5th, and 6th. We had Priest River High School in 3rd place. We acquired 30 gold medals, 34 silver, and 31 bronze. I should point out there were 29 kids in the class. <laughs> so I'm Matthew, and this is my third year in Akadega. And so the invitational meet is basically our second meet of the year. And so 28 students participated in this meet. Um, our five SHS teams placed for a second, third, fifth, and sixth. Uh, Priest River placed fourth. And then we got 31 gold medals, 32 silver medals, and 40 bronze medals. Um, the regional meet was our first. Oh, my name is Photo, and this will this upcoming year will be my second year on the team. Um, the regional meet is our third meet of the year. It takes place in the winter. Um, we had 27 um, students participate in this competition. Um, out of the five teams, we placed first, second, third, and fifth. Priest River placed fourth. I'd also like to point out that our fifth team, I think it only had two people on it in total. So even with that, they still managed to like get an insane amount of points, even though there was only two of them, when there should be seven or eight? Nine. 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 Oh, Nine. Oh. Okay. <laughs> um, in total, we, this meet, we got 35 gold medals, 31 silver medals, <coughs> and 36 bronze medals. So I'm Jenna Hughes, and this will be my third year on the academic decathlon team here. And only a few months ago, we competed at the Idaho Academic Decath the Idaho State Academic Decathlon Championship. And there we had we had three teams, most of the two of which consisted of nine people, the other was a bit smaller. And from these three teams, we placed first, third, and fifth in the large school division. Additionally, we also won the state, we also won the state title for the fifth year in a row. In a row. <laughs> Additionally, Priscilla Hester won the Phil Corrado Award, which is, which is for the achievement of like the highest speech and interview combined score. And this was the tenth year in a row that a Sandpoint Academy has won this award. <laughs> Overall, we will, overall, we won 30 gold medals, 29 silver, silver medals, and 24 bronze medals, just but only 16 decathletes. Nice. So um, to cap it all off, we had our national finals in, finals in Frisco, Texas, and this was fun. So we had our, our main team with our top um, nine decathletes with um, one of them in varsity and ending up dropping out. So we had eight total, but those eight people, um, oh, I'm Pete Hazley. <laughs> I'm a, going into my third year as an academic and I'm a captain. And so um, we competed at nationals and this is something that we fundraised for throughout the year and we got various donations by a lot of generous um, organizations. And so yeah, we all flew down to Texas and spent like three days there and competed in all the same divisions, but while being immersed with a bunch of other really elite and like highly organized teams, and I think it was really mind blowing to see like the the level of competition that exists on a national level. And so it was a fantastic learning curve for our team, and it was the first time that it was in person since 2019, I think. So for Miss Stockman's last year, it was really fun to go like down to Texas as a team and compete in person. And so we um, medals at nationals are a lot harder to come by since there's so much competition, and so um, we so we got bunch of various medals and a lot of people on the team like almost everyone got one so that was pretty cool and um, yeah we got third place out of 10 teams in our division I think and that was a goal that we like we haven't really accomplished that at Sandpoint or even at any school in Idaho like ever so we were, we were really like pioneering Sandpoint in Idaho academia so that was really really fun and it was the, the fruition of Miss Stockman's coaching coming into practice so very nice yeah. We have a really cool trophy. Yeah. Yes. 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 <laughs> so um, I would like to just thank, first and foremost, Pate, because they um, award us a grant every year that allows us to buy uh, the curriculum materials and supporting materials that allows them to learn all of this amazing stuff. 
Um, it, it, it's an expensive program, and, and we wouldn't be able to do it without their financial support. I also would like to thank Lori Bach, um, who was going to come tonight, but had a, a family issue to deal with, and she chaperoned our trips to state and to nationals and really took a lot of the pressure off of me when it came to hurting kids. Um, I'd like to thank everyone who volunteered at our three local meets that were all held at San Point High School. We're always looking for people to help with speech and interview especially. Um, and we had quite a few national team sponsors that came through, some family members, some parents of former decathletes sent in money, some businesses, and I especially want to thank the Kiwanis um, because they, they gave us quite a healthy donation um, and all they asked in return is that we go to one of their meetings when we got back and tell them how the trip went. So we did that, had a nice lunch, um, and then I got a very nice message from Dick Vale that I wanted to share with you. Um, we wanted to thank you for your effort and time in presenting at our luncheon. I think of all the hours of planning that go on behind the scenes that folks really don't see, and it has to be a great satisfaction to relish the achievement of this year's team. The team was impressive. Everyone talked about the young people and their accomplishment. In the press today, we hear so much of the negative. As I stated, it's a shame that these students are not constantly recognized. As the students spoke, it made me truly delighted that our club had a small part in helping the team out with their travels. We certainly have a right to be proud. Nice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm Becky Hayden. I get the privilege of taking over next year for these delightful people, um, inspired by my daughter, Stella, <laughs> and all of the friends. So the next year's theme is going to be technology and humanity. So we've already started, they've already started working on this. I will start reading it now that school is out. There's a binder that's, there's, I don't know how to do this. Um, yeah, so that we can make it, we're hopefully going to Pittsburgh for national this year. And I think wow. this team can definitely do that. And we'll miss this up. So thank you. But I'll still be here. And she'll help. <laughs> if anybody wants to volunteer for our news, this is terrific. Yes. I would like to present you with, from myself and the board. These are, since you're the captain, I'll let you Google them. But those are made from the pantry in Clarkbrook. They're whole ingredients. They're really healthy for you. Special treats. But we got you an extra one for, when, for going to nationals for the first time ever. Please share them with, with your advisor, too. Awesome. So, thank you. Congratulations thank you. to all of thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I asked the team, what do I do? And they said, you keep us on task, you give us materials to learn, and you sometimes feed us. Pop the pizza, we go. There we go. That was good. Thank you. Have fun. Thank you. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. So. Uh, we're going to move on to the superintendent report. I teared up in theirs. Is this going to be no. tear jerker? No. <laughs> okay, bye guys. She did, she did a graduation as well. I know, I keep tearing up. Okay, my final presentation, uh, superintendent report for the 22-23 school year. Uh, one patron follow-up. Um, I just wanted to follow up. Geraldine Meyer presented about the number of scholarships, and I wanted to just thank the local generosity. She will talk about it, but we had over 250,000 at Sequoia High School in local generosity of scholarships, and 134,000 at Clark Fork, plus over 100,000 for GI Bill. Uh, just, just a lot of gratitude we have as a school district to our local supporters. It, she'll talk more about it, but I just really wanted to thank everyone um, from myself and from the from everybody here uh, to the patrons for that. Doing a very quick, operative board quick summary. I've been updating the board every uh, week with the board update and I've been updating the board every month um, on my superintendent transition P of A, plan of action and how the goals have been progressing. 
So I highlight a little bit when we're in public so that the patrons and anybody who watches the video um, can hear how I'm going on my goal progress. So I'm not, I just want you to know this is for people to read later. I'm not going to read the slides to everyone, but these are the identified tasks. When I met with the board when I was hired, I'm putting those five goals out there and then I did identified tasks. What were the steps I needed to uh, reach to be able to get to the goal? So I'm not going to read through these for everyone, but the first one was to build a strong working relationship with the board, administrators, with the community. And you can see just some of the things that I've done um, throughout the district. I've been very visible. We have at the district office, we have a board. Um, I always say what gets measured gets done. So we have a board to keep track of all the school visits, um, all the community visits, so that we know um, how to get out and spread out our wings uh, to be throughout the district. The second one was to gather input from all stakeholders to formulate the first iteration of our strategic plan. So everyone's pretty familiar um, with the different ways that I've been out into the community and gathering input. We've done several surveys. Um, you'll see later the community coffee clutches, toured all the facilities uh, with Matt Deal. He's here, the director. And we did our first annual feedback uh, parent survey, which led to our LPOSD, everyone's familiar with this now, but our four buckets for our strategic plan. This is our five-year strategic plan, which we will revisit every year. And at the center of everything we do is our students. So we will be looking at that. What is our measure of growth for our students? Uh, make sure that everywhere they're growing academically, well-being, behaviorally, every day in all environments. Now, the next thing is an update was our district safety task force. So I'd like to ask if the district safety task force could join me up here um, so we can do a quick update. We, we all came to you in the beginning of the year. Um, I, was, I started on July 5th and our first meeting for our district safety task force team was on July 11th. So we got right down to business. Uh, you know, less than a week later after I started, we were already meeting. So we're going to do just a quick update. We would really like to update the board what we've done this last year, and I'm pretty proud of this group. So we're going to introduce them. I just, not everyone could be here tonight, but I want you to know who's here and who participated for the last year. Matt Yale, Facilities Director. Mike Nielsen, Retired Law Enforcement. Crosby Cajun, Assistant Principal at the Middle School. Mark Patterson, Iowa Office of School Safety. Alex Bromwell, Transportation Department. Uh, Drew Hancock, Retired Law Enforcement. And we have other folks, if you want to see who's on the team, there is a link you'll see in, yeah, coming up. But we, uh, I just want to point out that we were meeting weekly until school started, and then we started meeting bi-weekly a couple of times a month, and then we met monthly, and we've been meeting monthly ever since. So it's a lot of time that the folks have given up to come um, to meet. We started out with about two hour meetings and now we're down to about an hour, hour and 15 is where we usually can sum it up. So our update for you, safety does not happen by accident. That was a quote that we picked out. We've been very intentional this year. We've done a lot of research and a lot of brains have gone together to make decisions for the district on what's best for kids. So I wanna point out, um, our SRO is not here tonight. He had a conflict, but Officer Don Little, the Sandpoint Police have been here all year that they haven't missed a meeting at all, um, which has been really helpful. Our parent, which you remember that even had me start on this, was Tara Lobb, and she's at Sagal. She started the Sagal Parent Watch. She couldn't be here, but she's the one that spoke to you when I first got hired. She was um, speaking to you about it. And then we have, as you heard, um, emergency management, uh, Chief Lindsay, Chief Gil Gilcrest, um, have also been coming, Bob Howard and Cameron McComb from emergency, uh, local emergency planning. They've been here also, er and then the other folks, uh, TJ Clary from Sandpoint High School has also, he started out Southside and then at Sandpoint High School has been coming also. Um, am I missing anybody that comes on a regular basis as well? That's it. Okay. Just want to give credit. And also um, Dave Watkins from Sandpoint David, High School. You. Thank you. David Watkins. I knew there was somebody else trying to visually go around. 
This is our why. At the beginning of every meeting, we read it. Matt, would you like to read it for us? The Lake Pondre School District Safety Task Force, composed of first responders, parents, and district leadership, is committed to gathering stakeholder feedback, review, reviewing current district practices, and making recommendations to proactively improve school safety protocols to protect all students and staff. And though it seems like cumbersome and sometimes people are like, oh, Becky, but I think what it does for our group is every single time we start out our meeting, we remember our why. It's important that we remember at the center of everything we're doing is we're protecting students and staff. All of our decisions are centered around that. And we wrote that together. It took us several sessions, but we created it together and wrote it together. Uh, Mark Federson and Matt Deal, um, they did these. Matt, can, uh, Mar Mark, can you just say a little bit about what you did every year you're going to do with us and what you did this year? The vulnerability assessments? Oh, okay, so our office is mandated to do triennial assessments of every school in the state of Idaho. I'm the North Safety Analyst. <coughs> I work for all schools from Grangeville to Canada. But that said, we only touch schools every three years, but the school district here, in partnership with our office, is wanting to go a little bit step further and have a continual reassessment of the things that go on through the reports that have been generated and through what the safety task force has generated as issues or concerns that might be uh, addressed proactively to mitigate those vulnerabilities. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And he met with all the principals and so like new principals like Jen Majors at Northside was able to meet with him and that's helpful for principals when they're starting their tenure out of school. Stakeholder feedback, if you remember back in the fall, we did a staff and a parent survey to look where did we need to address it. We've shared the results with you. And then what's really, uh, we had some lofty goals, and I think what's important is for you to see what we have accomplished. It's kind of hard to see with the light, but the very bright ones are green, and the, one, the other ones are yellow, which means in progress, and if they're not, there's only one area that we feel like we haven't started yet that's going to be a focus for next year. Does anybody want to talk on anything here? I was just going to let them look it over, but does anybody want to I, 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 I'll, I will attest that after being in this district and being in all the schools for, for a lot of years, the schools have come a long way and just with the protocols that are in place and, and the direction from leadership that the, the schools are in a way better place safety-wise than they were a year ago. Mm -hmm. Crosby, do you want to talk about the emergency drill? Yeah, thank you to Matt and his team for a lot of the infrastructure and the nuts and bolts with a lot of the, the safety facets within our facilities. Um, one thing that I notice greatly within especially Sandpoint Middle School is a sense of urgency with staff and even students about awareness of safety, awareness of these processes and procedures. One example that I can give is like if a random car or somebody pulls into our north area it's like three or four people and a student coming up to me going, Mr. Cajun, who's that over there? So there's just more of a robust awareness of all of these, <coughs> excuse me, all of these elements of safety. And that goes down to the smallest thing like, I see people checking doors, exterior doors, making sure that they're locked and secure. And so, like Dr. Meyer said, when you when you have a why and you have goals and you put it out there, people are targeting towards achieving those things. Mm -hmm. So that awareness that we have is night and day compared to years past. And it all comes back around to the relationships that staff are building with students so that nobody goes over, uh, unnoticed and we're, we're really making those positive connections. And one other thing, and then, you know, we're telling you that we, we feel we're in a good place doing good things. 
that said, there, there's certainly from the physical plant side of things, there, there's much more to do. Right, so we'll go on to that. Thank you for that segue. Our controlled access, you see that we have, these are all operational. I told you, I spoke earlier in board meeting a few months ago about the reports that we have done, the Secret Service, and protecting America's schools. We have digested that, and as a group, we have read it and talked about it and what's important for our local area to, to glean from that. Well, this controlled access really shows that in the morning and at high schools, it tells you a percentage where there's been acts of violence, and so we have proactively really made a priority as a team where we're gonna focus on where we think we get the biggest bang for our buck. These operational entrances, thanks to Matt and his team, they have, these four are operational now. You can see that over there. And staff, I've told you, will be able to use this and put in their number. So it'll be a keyless entry eventually as well, which will help us um, on another front. And then today, Matt told me 95% are complete at our elementary schools, and he thinks this summer in July that those will, we're waiting for some parts. Yeah, well, no, the parts are all in, and actually, that's Washington just this week or last week we installed the hardware. We were probably at Northside in the past couple days mm -hmm. um, with the hardware, pulling the wire, and then we'll bring the contractor back in for the fin finishing touches. And also, um, our technology department's also been a big player in this project, too. That's a major, great. Um, we also, the campus fencing, that is probably, uh, when we did our vulnerability assessments, that's one of the high cost items is fencing. It also is one of the highest, um, I, I, what's another way to say bang for your buck? Keep your, yeah, return on investment, yeah. Um, and so, Mark, if you could talk about that, and Matt, if you could just let them know about the fencing, just to update them on that. So, we look at the schools overall as a, a layered uh, processes, right? From physical security to culture and climate to behavioral threat assessments, all those things stack onto each other. So if one fails, another one's supposed to pick up, and so you never have a catastrophic failure. But the idea is that, that you have to be able to layer them in such a way that it never goes away, it never is accepted as, hey, we put this in so we don't have to worry about it anymore. For instance, we have an exterior door that's locked, somebody props it open, you just defeated that layer, if you will. For fencing, the exterior part of a school, part of it is to show territorial, this is my area, you can't come in, you can't come in, sure, and if it's a public school, of course, you can list out on your sign, this is the time that this area is specifically closed. Mm -hmm. But a lot of schools have missing fencing, fencing that has pass-through gates, yeah. uh, fencing that's missing during a movement from one building to another, which allows for an extended period of open time between those two buildings. All those things are relative, right? <coughs> Part of the operational aspect is to determine whether or not a piece of fence will allow that operation to go through in a more safe environment. So that's some of the things that we've talked about with the district on putting certain fencing in certain areas. I think one one example would be when they had the portable at the high school. Portable, the door between the main building and the portables were always open because there was constant movement back and forth. So it, you don't have any security there, right? So when they put that fencing there to secure that off, you can allow for that movement you still can allow another layer by having that door eventually lock itself. Mm -hmm. But the overall just free access was no longer there because of the fencing that they put up. And so our fencing update as of today. We were able to um, complete a couple of fencing projects. We have another one that will be completed in the next couple of weeks at North Side. So we had a couple that were far easier. South Side, we enclosed a couple spots, added a few gates, so that that's actually completely fenced playground now. North side is, is going to be finished this month, completely fenced. Um, we made improvements at Farm and Stidwell at some areas to the north of the building that Mr. Federson recommended that were like kind of a back way where somebody could come in. There's more to do. Um, there at Sagal, we did some back areas um, but there, there is more to do there. So we did make some progress on fencing. 
And fencing is very expensive, at, especially after the COVID, it's very expensive. So that's a priority that we're working on, but it's not a thing. There's some other areas. I do also want to say the interior room in some of our post-action reports we've talked about, having interior doors locked, even if they're propped for teachers to get ventilation and stuff, they have to be locked. We have um, principals in the audience who go around and that's one of their goals and they check and actually do a report back out to their staff and to us and say, this is an area they're checking because that's a very big um, concern if our interior doors aren't locked. So I've been doing, and then one last thing before we go off of this is um, the uh, parent watch program that um, they may be starting that at, uh, at the Sandpoint Middle School next year. Yes, um, Sagal Elementary has kind of blazed the trail on getting a parent volunteer um, program underway. They sounds like it's been pretty successful this year. We're still working out the nuts and bolts at Sandpoint Middle School as to the scope of that and how we will utilize parent volunteers helping us out. And we have our armed, uh, they're actually called armed district <laughs> security specialists and those interviews are on Friday. So that's in green. And then you can see some of the intercom systems and window safety film. Um, we did interior, thanks to Matt and his crew. They did do interior where we had flimsy, which is helpful for the interior security. And we're still talking about exterior. We also are looking at the safety. You know, we get $20,000 because the new money that came, $20,000 per building. So all the buildings are submitting their desires to our district safety, safety task force team. And then our safety team is prioritizing and will be submitting those as a district um, this summer. So at our next, one of our next meetings. Okay, I think our last thing to tell you is we, this is our priority sheet we did way back in August. <coughs> We as a group are going to come back together to see what we go through, what we've done, and what we once we have all the submissions from the principal, what are the next priorities? Um, okay, so that's it. Anyone else who didn't get to speak? Does anyone else want to add anything, Drew or Elf or Kelly? Okay. All right. Well, thank you all for coming very much. We appreciate it. Thank you for your, all of you. Okay, the next goal was assessing unfinished, unfinished learning. And as you know, uh, Andrew and Casey came and presented in the fall with our baseline data. They did um, a mid, just after our mid-year and reported back. And then we're getting all of our wonderful principals together tomorrow for our end of the year meeting. And we'll be coming back and looking and, and finalizing that. So the board will be getting an update on that. And then the last was a comprehensive and collaborative communication. I had my second coffee clash, uh, not as successful as the first time, but we did try an afternoon one, uh, definitely not as many people. So we're going to try a noon one in the fall, but we will continue that and uh, do hopefully three a year is what we're striving for. Our loop, June into the year, you should have had that. It was a quick one because I just wanted to do it before everyone went out of town and wasn't going to read it. So we did that. And then um, if you haven't, anyone in the audience or watching the video or any of the board, if you haven't signed up for our Instagram, which then posts to the, the Facebook thing, um, <laughs> but I just post on the Instagram and then it goes to, the, to that Facebook thing. But they, this is how you do it. You can put your phone up to that and then you can sign up for it. So then you get updated in everything that we're doing. Sorry, I don't have Facebook, so I've got it. It's fun. A lot, of people, a lot of people have it though, and Kristen really, Kristen Hawkins says it's really good to keep people up to date. That's right. So, um, I want to make in. So that was the end of the superintendent goals progress. That's how we uh, kind of capped out the year. Um, I would, you can ask me any questions, but I'll uh, finish on this couple of notes with new enrollment. If you don't have any questions on the goal progress for the year. Anyway. Okay. So we talked about the new enrollment um, update, and I just want to tell you, I did mention that in the law next year, February 1st will be the application deadline. Uh, in speaking with several other superintendents, I, we are not going to recommend that we charge tuition. 
We are accepting applications now for our district. The criteria we will be using is attendance, behavior, you can look at the discipline student beha uh, behavior log, and um, three, oops, that three thing was supposed to be, and the capacity, so based on capacity. Shoot, it didn't. It's good here. I know, but the special services is in. Oh, did you guys see it on yours? Yeah. Okay, so somehow it got met, it changed when I put it up here. You want to see the numbers? No, I know it by heart. Thank you, though. <laughs> the class enrollment capacity, these are what our district is going to um, recommend. Uh, this is what we're going to go off of. K1, if it's under 18, 2, 3 is 20, 4th grade is 23, 5, 6 is 25, and 7, uh, 7 to 12 is 25 in their core ELA, which is English Language Arts class. That does not mean that our students that live in district will be turned away if they're over those numbers. Those are our cap sizes for open enrollment. Those are under what our exemplary numbers are for our district. Does that make sense? <coughs> so, okay, so when that, I'm assuming, you know, that's our arbitrary number that we put and we say, yes, this is how we want to keep, this is what we want to keep our classes. Yes, it's not arbitrary. Not arbitrary. I mean, it's we have exemplar numbers and we just went for two under right. that number. Right. That's how we did it. So, hypothetical here. Okay. A whole lot of people from Priest River might want to apply. Why would you say that? Just hypothetical, they're our next door neighbor. Uh, Apple, who knows? Whoever wants to come here. So if, once we hit that, is so we can opt out at that point and say, sorry, we've hit our, our measure. Yes. So we can turn kids over. We have that are out, out of district, out we of can district. say we are full. Okay. Yes. Thank you. People who live in the district, we cannot say that, which is why all the districts that are doing this in the state, all the other superintendents I've talked to, you have to set your cap sizes a little bit down or you will fall into huge cap sizes and remember i feel pretty i feel not pretty i feel very strongly about our patrons are paying a tax rate right. to have reasonable class sizes they have paid a levy to keep those quality teachers and reasonable class sizes in our district they have small neighborhood schools we have two wonderful principals here tonight that have small neighborhood schools and then we want to be able to keep that for our voters. The way we do that is we have these reasonable cap sizes, and that's why we pick these numbers. And then what you can't see here, it will be when you look online, and yeah. then the board can see it. I'm looking on it's, it. What it's it here, be? yeah. So I'm going to explain that next. So okay. I'm just letting the folks know in the audience that you can't see where it says yeah. special services, but underneath, we are funded at 5.5% percent from the State Department of Education and the CFOs helped us figure this piece out. That's how much funding we get for students with disabilities for that have IEPs under IDEA for special services. We are funded at 5.5. So we've rounded that up and we've said 6%. So currently we're almost near 15%, meaning that if students are have special services, if we are not above six percent we will take new applicants otherwise that will be capped at six percent all right does that make sense any questions about this because i know this is coming up right now we are working on that as a group and we will i am going to be reviewing those next week and starting with high school to let in students um it's it's definitely something, obviously, we have a lot of ninth grade families that are applying. And once with IHSAA, Idaho High School Activities Association, which is athletic and activities, those students, if they start with us in ninth grade, they can stay as long as they don't have an attendance or behavior. They are allowed to play sports with us then, or activities, academia, theater, drama, band, choir, all of those, they're like allowed to stay. Yes. Yeah. But if they move to a different district or they don't come in ninth grade, um, it's not necessarily accepted. Yes. So do they they have to attend the school to play on the sports team, correct? Or live in our district as a homeschool student. So homeschoolers outside of district could not play no. sports? No. No. 
Now, there may be uh, uh, there may be a hardship that they could apply for. I'm not familiar enough with that. If there is an out of district homeschool family that applies for hardship, that would have to go through the IHSAA. Because I know if a family was to move here after ninth grade because their district did not offer sports anymore or their sport anymore, they can apply to the state for a hardship. But then they look at the numbers and they look at it. So if families move to start ninth grade, they have a better chance of fulfilling that sports career in our district. What if they played sports in junior high for the middle school from out of district? You mean our middle school? A home school played for the middle school, you know, home school from out of district. Home school, that's different then. Could that continue on into high school? Are they grandfathered in if they're before ninth grade? Does that make sense? Do they live in our district? No. I think I I don't I have to I'll follow up with you if you okay. can correct me. I think that they have to apply for a hardship is my understanding, but I could be wrong. I I don't want to misspeak. The okay. IHSAA does not qualify middle school students because it's a high, high school. school. Yeah, a whole new slate. Yeah. So it, another question. Sorry, Dr. Mara. No, um, you're good. The is the IH I H S A I whatever two A's high yeah. school in there somewhere. <laughs> um, they have the overall say, yes. right? Yes. So it's whoever that board or whatever they say. Yes. Yeah, Becky, you're, you're taking this family, yes. period. Okay. Yes. Okay. That's my current understanding. Now I know there are, because of this new open enrollment law, they are not written into this law. And I can tell you several yeah. superintendents throughout the state have questioned the director, Ty Jones, like, wait, what about this? What about that? And the only thing that we have been told at this point is you still have to apply. They did not put IHSAA in this law, so you still have to apply for a hardship if you're not starting the high school in ninth grade. That's all we've been told at this point. Does the homeschool academy count to be attended? So like, yes. Home, there, so if they, a homeschooler attended the homeschool academy, they would be yes. an LPOSD student. Yes, correct, correct. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Okay, if there's any questions, certainly reach out to me. I want families to know that after I presented this to you tonight, we are going to start looking at applications so that I can start allowing, starting with the high school, allowing students in for next year. Because that will help us with class numbers, knowing our class numbers. Um, you know, Sanford High School principal is here. She wants to get her staffing and, and things in order. So that, we want to start on the high school as soon as possible. Also, as you know, there's camps and things to do to get ready for athletics over the summer, and I feel like that has to be our top priority. I just wanted to make sure the board didn't have any questions about how our district was moving forward with open enrollment before I started doing it. So this would be your opportunity today, because we'll start tomorrow, mm -hmm. okay? I've gotten a lot of questions on it. It's a, a people yeah, are right. aware and know mm -hmm. that there's changes. Is there anything that you um, would like me to do different as a board versus what I've just told you that we're gonna move forward? Does anybody have any concerns about how we're moving forward. Right. I don't have a concern. I have a question. Our enrollment capacity numbers, what is our what are our what our what are our average class sizes now in those areas? Like is there room for people to come in with those numbers? Yes. Yeah, she said oh, plus two. Plus two. Yes. So yes. we're we're at about Well we're over. We have some um, very um, large class sizes like for instance at Northside right now. We can't take any more kindergartners. Like, unless we get a whole second full kindergarten class at Northside, we are going to have to have all those kindergartners go to Kootenai Elementary. Does that make sense? Yep. If they're coming from Priest River or Bonners, then there'd be Farm and Sidwell, Washington. Right. If they're coming from below us at Kootenai, there could be Southside and Sagal. Yep. Um, so we have capacity. What it really means is we are going to have to have a spreadsheet and keep up to date so that if we get to that spot to where, ooh, if we get a couple more, it's going to have to, especially elementary, it's going to have to break off into two teachers because we do not want to create combo classes at all if possible. That's not our best learning. We want to keep. So if we get enough students in to create a whole other teacher and hire a teacher and we have the classroom, we have the capacity to do that at Farm and Sidwell and at, at Tootney, for instance, okay. Sagal. Okay. So it's kind of like a master, a big yeah. master plan and getting enough people in 
or stopping it here where we don't let them in because it's going to create a, a overcrowding and we don't have enough to fund another teacher. Right. Right. And so that I kind of usually am able to do that in my mind, but I think this is going to have to be like a big whiteboard thing and have the spreadsheet to be able to look at it. Uh -huh. I think the toughest thing, at least for, for me to wrap my head around, is like it's one thing when you, if you're paying taxes in this county, that's a whole different story than if you're not paying taxes here and you're just like, oh, I like the soccer coach there. That's where I want to go. That's, that's not. So you need to speak to the governor because he's the one that put this. Well, I'll call him after me. Yeah. Well, it could be <laughs> the other way, too. I mean, our county goes way all the way down to Apple. I mean, right, true. Easier for maybe some elementary kids to go to Apple elementary. Yeah. Good point. You know, I live half a mile north of the Bonner border, but I couldn't go to Apple. I couldn't send my kids to Apple. <laughs> you know, you so would probably pick perfect. Southside, though. Well, that was years ago, and I didn't send him there anyway. <laughs> but my point, you know, it could work the other way, too. Yeah. Our schools are so good. I don't think yeah. anyone's going to want to leave them. So that's just some a little bias. But. Okay, last one is financial literacy. And this, uh, Casey McLaughlin uh, garnered this information for the board. This was uh, Superintendent Debbie Critchfield's, uh, one of her new laws she put into place. And I just wanted you to see it, the House bill, and how our three high schools were going to meet uh, the intent of the law. So this is just a little bit of information for you for that. Okay. Uh, quick question on that before you move on. What's the um, curriculum tied to that? Is there a new curriculum that we'll have to see and adopt or vote on? Or how does that? They are going to put it into their current adoption that they have, and they feel like their personal and family finance is already covering what she wants um, for the financial literacy. But I can share that. It's on the website right now. It's already been approved. Mm -hmm. through what we already have. Yep. It's occurred yep. last week. That's yep. what I was asking. Yep. Okay. Any questions? All right. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Well, we are going to move on to public comments. And I have one. Mrs. Geraldine Meyer. Oh, no. Dr. Meyer kept saying, oh, and Jaren will talk about that later, and I was like, no, she's not on my agenda. <laughs> you have three minutes. I'm ready. <laughs> Start the timer. So I addressed the board with uh, the number of students that applied for scholarships and our process at Sampling High School that we basically help all students in the community, and I wanted to come back and kind of let you know the final tally and the final numbers. So I garnered this from our three public schools. Um, what I don't have information from is the number of scholarships that went to homeschool students, um, Forest Bird Charter School, or Priest River. And I know scholarships were given to those, but at some point I, I had to draw the line. And so I don't know those numbers, but our groups are really, um, and I think the other thing that it was exciting this year, especially for our two trustees who worked last year on the construction combine, there were huge amounts of dollars that were given for students that were interested in going into um, the trades, technical programs. Um, I had a student, they can't even use all their money um, for their HVAC program, right? They, they got so much scholarship dollar, they're like, can we hold it off till our third year? <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's really exciting to see. So, at Clark Fork High School, there was $91,000 given to seniors, an additional $35,000 given to students continuing in college. Um, Lake Ponderé School District, or Lake Ponderé Alternative High School, was awarded $20,000. Um, and what's exciting <coughs> about it is that that was split between two students. So that really oh, removes the barrier for those students. Um, and then at Sandpoint High School, there was $263,000 awarded to 61 seniors at Sandpoint High School, which is $4,300, um, $4,300 is what it averages out to be, although there were students who got less and students got more. Um, and then also it was exciting that we kept track of at Sandpoint High School, there was an additional $54,000 given to those students in college, in programs, 
or in a technical or trade that, that came back and said, hey, I finished my first year, I still need help, can we go? And so that's an area that is growing. And so I just, you know, I, I tell our students at our scholarship night, buy those elephant ears, buy those raffle tickets. Our community is just incredibly generous. And this is groups from Community Assistance League to the Bonner County Sportsman to the Human Rights Task Force to Life Choices Pregnancy to the Elks to Rotary. I mean, it's just, there are so many groups to memorials, people who are honoring to an anonymous person who wanted this to go there, you know, they're raw, they didn't want to pay taxes on it, so they're giving us their um, retirement because they don't need it right now. So, it's just awesome. So, yeah. just wanted to let you come back and report all that out. That's awesome. How lucky we are. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Did I make it? Yes. Right on. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's all good news. Um, we have a consent agenda, and you've all had a chance to look at it. I will just add that those, um, uh, permission for bid, those are in every year. It's not the bid itself, it's permission to go off the bid. So those are in, in, embedded in the consent agenda. Can I have a motion for this? I make a motion to approve the consent agenda. Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 That motion passes, and we do have a lot of uh, action items, but we should, we're going to start with the biggest one and invite our CFO, Lisa Halls, up. Is this like our last? The last Lisa presentation? The last Lisa presentation. This is it. For our budget presentation. Welcome. Good evening. So I'm presenting the proposed fiscal year 2023-2024 uh, budget. It is an action item, so at the end, after the discussion, we'll need a motion to approve and adopt the fiscal year 2024 budget. Uh, I'm going to quickly go through this budget document, which will be posted on our website tomorrow. This is not what we submit to the State Department of Education. Right. What we submit is basically general account uh, ledger account numbers and numbers. Um, this document, conversely, is meant to be an executive summary, mostly in narrative form for those that are not familiar with um, general ledger account numbers. So our fiscal cycle, it starts July 1st, 2023, and will span <coughs> through June 30th of 2024. You will see in the document, thank you to um, uh, uh, some of our uh, staff, there are lots of photos. The focus of our district, of course, is on students, and we want that to be reflected in our budget document. Under our district uh, profile, uh, well, it, it denotes our uh, school board members by zone, and it also shares with the audience that we have an annual meeting on January 9th of 2024. It also then lists all of our schools and uh, grade configurations, as well as our central office administrators, the financial team, the building principals, and our uh, department director. In a one paragraph district overview, it shares that we are um, one of the uh, um, area's major businesses. Our budget next year will be $53.5 million. In terms of student count, we rank 25th uh, in, in Idaho currently. The general fund, which is the major operational fund, will be 45.5 million on all the other funds, mostly federal funds, or 8.1 million. Mm -hmm. The school board reviewed this in May. This is just a visual uh, for the reader of the uh, structure of our district. And then I want to spend the time tonight on this budget summary uh, message. So we started in the district, our budgeting process in mid-November of 22, and um, finalized action with the board in April of 23. So about six months 
-hmm. And there are really three big things that uh, um, we focused on in terms of economic factors. The first is we have what's called an indefinite term supplemental levy. It's local property tax le uh, money. It's a fixed amount of $12.7 million. And next year, we that represent 27.9% of our general fund revenue. What's significant is that it is a drop of 3.2% of our general fund revenues from this year because it's a fixed amount. And this trajectory is going to continue. And that's uh, strategically planned for. We discussed this um, as far back as when we were actually configuring the levy in, that would have been August of 2019. Um, uh, um, more also part of our uh, di district's financial strategy is to maintain this fixed amount at a current annual level uh, for as many fiscal years as possible. In um, folding into that strategy, we supplanted nearly all of our ESSER uh, packages. There were three, about $10 million we supplanted. And it won't be until fiscal year 25 that we would start to spend down the reserves that we've built up to balance our budget. The second factor was that the state of Idaho closed its fiscal year 22 with absolutely record high reserves of $1.3 billion. And that poised uh, in terms of states in the nation, I think we had in terms of overall budget, the sixth highest uh, reserve balance uh, in the nation. That also allows for a lot of policy fights or discussion, and this, it was historic in terms of new leadership in session that started in January of 23, both in terms of the numbers of legislators and those in leadership, and of course, it's those elected officials that make the appropriation decisions, and the K-12 budget is the largest appropriation decision annually. The third factor uh, was, would a temporary rule that had been in place through the State Board of Education funding school districts on enrollment versus what's in statute to fund school districts on average daily attendance be continued in fiscal year 24? And it was pretty clear right out of the gate on uh, the first day of the session, the governor's state of the state address, he strongly signaled that he supported reverting back to average daily attendance. And that was practically imminent. There was very little policy deliberation on this matter over the session. For our district, and for almost every other school district, we will fall into protected status in fiscal year 24. That's a provision we've discussed here, uh, and I won't go into it, except that that will mean about a loss of $1.7 million compared for our school district compared to if we had been paid on enrollment in fiscal year 24. Overall, JFAC recommended an increase of a 15.4% to the K-12 budget for next year. That does, however, include federal funds. It's more like a 9% overall state increase to K-12. And now I wanted to accent two really important bills that were the result of the past legislative session. And it's kind of funny that they're bookmarked. The first was House Bill 1, which was actually in September of 2022 in a special legislative session. And the second was House Bill 292, which is at the very end of the session that the governor vetoed and the legislature overrode. So House Bill 1 added for higher ed and K-12, $410 million over current to education funding. And ultimately, the governor recommended and um, through these new dedicated funds, there was a, a, a sizable increase to classified staff in terms of the base salary at the state level and also an infusion of money for the teaching staff. But I do want to underscore, and I might even repeat it twice, that embedded in the increase to the teacher compensation, there are clear expectations for school districts 
um, that they must spend these uh, on teacher compensation and in fact we'll have to report back in November of 2023. The second important bill is House Bill 292. This was kind of the hallmark and centerpiece property tax piece of legislation and, uh, and that, as I said, was appropriated right at the end of the session. Um, our district was very swift and aggressive to rebuke the Idaho State Tax Commission's initial interpretation of this legislation. And as a direct result, really, of our district's prowess, um, what is now in, in place, amended temporary rule 810 was approved by the Tax Commission that aligned with our district's interpretation. Why this is so important, particularly for our school district, is that it is a net result of a new funding stream of one, about $1.4 million ongoing for facilities. This is the real first facility funding since <coughs> this is my 19th year um, uh, dedicated uh, in Idaho to K-12. Then I wanted to just point out that overall uh, our, our our compensation increase in this budget it ranges from about an average of 8 up to 9.6% uh, increase in order to meet the clear expectations of the uh, increased teacher allocation for fiscal year 24 we had to add 8% to the base salary alone for teachers. I also would uh, accent that we in order to balance our budget, we had to cut $1.6 million. That included cuts to programs, but primarily to teaching and classified staff. There's also $389,000 budgeted in contingency to address um, student enrollment fluctuations as we open up school or other, um, I guess we would call them emergencies. Our district has no debt obligation, but there are now a couple of pockets of capital expenditures next year. Finishing out with the third ESSER package, the HVAC programs of $816,000, um, some purchase of buses, some purchases of IT equipment, and now I aforementioned $1.4 million in what's called the school facility fund, and those uh, um, will be up to the administration to allocate. And then I also write here that state and federal authority in many areas is now diminishing or even eclipsing local, floor, local school board authority uh, in budgeting. There are multiple um, categorical um, mandates and the, the teacher compensation is just the most uh, recent here in Idaho. And then if we continue through this budget, the next uh, document, um, you'll see that we are projecting basically overall um, student uh, enrollment in the student, a flat student count. And then also on the next uh, slide, we many, actually the year I started, we, uh, the, similarly the first thing I did was to op recommend to the board op um, developing an operating reserve policy. Um, we're projected to end our reserve balance at 18 seven million dollars and to start spending that down to balance our budget in fiscal year 25. And then the rest of the document is more granular. It just goes through our general fund by program and then delineates our various federal funds. So that concludes my prepared remarks, but before I open it up to questions from the board, I just would wholeheartedly extend my sincere appreciation to our current school board members, all the school board members that I reported to over the last 19 years, to the five superintendents that have been my bosses, to my colleagues for their civil, uh, civil, I'm sorry, <laughs> civil service as well as their support of my financial leadership and strategy. Are there questions? Before we have questions, I just want to tell you how much I have appreciated the years I've been on this board, going on eight years now, um, the thoroughness, the trust I've had in what you tell us. I've always known that you've had uh, so much knowledge stuck in your head. I feel like you're leaving it in excellent hands for your
successor in this role, and we have been blessed to have uh, your expertise at the helm here as CFO. Thank you. And um, I'll just do this now. Okay. We have a little bit. <laughs> you can pick it up when you're okay. when we're <laughs> when we're done with questions, but don't let me forget this. Okay. Very thoughtful but of you. Thank it you has so been. Um, I just I just know that over these years you have guided us through some really difficult times, and um, it's always been with a thoroughness and dedication to detail that I have appreciated and trusted in, so thank you. Thank you. I'm just gonna <laughs> Are there questions regarding this? We all had a chance to look at this. Before. Thank you for saving jobs, because yeah. you saved jobs very recently, a lot of people don't know that, um, and your attempt, attention to detail, mm -hmm. especially at the legislative level, and your willingness to step up and um, you say our district, that's your hard work. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of people in this district that don't know that, and we owe you a, a, a huge a, a, a debt of gratitude. So thank you. Lisa. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. If there are no questions, I will hear a motion. Uh, do we have a <laughs> Hold on. There is there's a motion here. There we go. The motion would be to, to approve the fiscal year 2024 and adopt the budget. I make a motion to approve and adopt the 2024 uh, budget for the school district as presented. It's moved and seconded. Fumbling. Thank Any questions? All those in favor? Aye. 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 That motion passes. So Thank you so much. Thank, Thank, Thank you, Lisa. I'm around giving you a hug. Uh, I, yeah. I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. That's what you're Thank you. Thank you. Just so you know, our admin team is going to say goodbye to her tomorrow, so I'm not going to say anything publicly right now, but our whole entire admin team and directors, um, people that she owes. Get to have their own party. We will have our own, uh, yes, so I'm just letting people know that we appreciate her as well, but I'm not going to publicly say You're it. You're not going to gush about it right nope, here? No, not right yet. <laughs> okay. Um, we have several other things to just hit through, and the very first one is action item for the superintendent evaluation timeline. Um, you've seen this document in, in previous years. This is just approving the timeline on how we handle the evaluation. I'll hear a motion for that. Uh, I make a motion to approve the superintendent evaluation timeline. Second. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Oh, any discussion? No. Oh. That passed. Uh, <laughs> the second is the approval of the district calendars, and they're all in here. And uh, were there any questions from any of you regarding these calendars? They're outlined with student certified, student certified, two years worth. Did you see any, anything that raised questions? Just making sure that you saw that next year we're adding the seventh and eighth grade for student-led conferences. Our plan is then the next year we would add ninth grade and then roll it up. Um, so every year we'd be adding a year on until the entire district would be a non-student day. We still got to count it for attendance according to the state but then it would be a culmination when they're in their senior project would be presented on that same day. That's our final goal for that. Okay. I'm glad you did call Those attention to that. So. Um, you have June 7th for graduation. Uh, there's going to be rain that day? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it, Wait, what time? Um, <laughs> Ms. Crossingham and I have talked about it, and I think we... We might have a different day for graduation next year, but we'll have to bring that back to you because it didn't make it. It'll have to be some sort of. We have some ideas that true for Okay. Uh, we actually, she did some. I'm not. This is actually not facetious, but she did some research, and then I talked to Noah. We both did some research on the when lightning and rain storms happen, and so we are considering just putting it out there. We're considering um, having Saturday morning graduation at Sanford High School next year. We will bring the calendar back to you. We're going to do our research. We've done our research, but we will. She wants to talk to the other people. Yeah. Okay. But we do feel 
that that would be a great decision. So ignoring that, yes. Sorry. Do you um, do you have questions on the calendars as presented? It's a little hard to even fathom the 24, 25 calendar, but if there were changes to it, we would yeah, see those. Back. So I'll hear a motion for the whole set. I make a motion to approve the district calendars for 2023-24 and 2024-25 school years. I'll second that. We've been seconded. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 That motion passes. <clears throat> and then we have a resolution uh, for nutrition services. And is um, Lisa's here if we have questions. Okay. You had a chance to look at this resolution, and this is for the off food nutrition. Is there any discussion? Is there yeah. approval of this? It's the same. It's every year. this comes around every year. What we approve every year. I make Save motion. money by bulk. Yes. Exactly. I make a motion to approve resolution 23-04, the Region 1 Co-op for Nutrition Services for 2023-24. I second. It's moved and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 And I'm going to move right on to the second resolution, which is the resolution and CFO Wallace is here if you have any questions. P stands for uh, procurement. Procurement. Do you have any background on this one? Um, yes, I do. We did this in Lakeland, and it, um, but I'll let Mr. Wallace uh, I speak. would, yeah, this would be helpful to just have a tiny bit of history. It's helpful for the, it's helpful for our schools and for our budgeting and finance department, but I will let him speak to it. Welcome. Welcome. Well, the P-Card program, uh, the one that <coughs> is associated with this resolution, is a program that um, started with the Illinois Associated School Business Officials, and they partnered with the Bank of Montreal with the BMO for this program. The, the program's expanded now that it, it's used extensively in Washington with WASBO, the Washington Associated School Business Officials. They're in about 25 states. Um, and so they sort of tailored the PCARD program for cities, counties, school districts. Um, there's no fees associated with the program, um, no cost at all. You get actually get a rebate uh, amount, depending on your volume at Lakeland, we are getting over $10,000 a year in rebates. Um, <clears throat> and so the program, it's as big as you want to make it, you can start off slow and go, but you effectively uh, get procurement cards, which are, you know, they, they're really not credit cards, you pay within 30 days, you know, once you, once you get the, the charges. Um, but you can have department cards, you can have also have them for individuals. Um, they have a management sort of platform where you can see the cards, you can um, up limits on an individual card if you want, you can go down, you can see those That's centralized. Yeah, um, it's so called spend dynamics. Parameters are all set. Correct. Yeah. And so there's even times you could take a car and say, I want it inactive right now. I want it active. Um, similar protections of credit card companies that if there's fraud, it, it'll happen. Um, you know, we have, you know, some at Lakeland, we have Lakeland High School department cards where they're using for, let's say, the coaches when we go down the state, swiping gas, you know, and if one of those got compromised mm -hmm. one, you know, suddenly you had charges on Singapore, you could say, you know, yeah, this wasn't, you this wasn't us, us. right, and they would, they would back you <coughs> up with that fraud. Can I just give an example of how that's helpful? We're still that a little bit antiquated, in my opinion, because we're, um, like Phil Kimmick, when he went down, he had to do a purchase order for the $5 per student and then get that and he had to get it in advance to go to this bank to cash it to get the cash to pay for it and this would be in my opinion it has a better paper trail to keep track of he this amount of money is allocated per student for the coach for the athletic event they go and they say we're gonna 
pay for this meal, they bring back the receipt, and that is like better kept track of, and it's all on the statement versus, right now it feels like to me that it's a little bit fragmented, and also bus drivers, when they go on trips, they have to bring their receipts back to be reimbursed, this way they could use this, and there's, in my opinion, it keeps a really good track of it, and there is the rebate that we also would get. Okay. Um, I will hear a motion to approve. There can be more discussion between, but. And I, oh, discussion between. Wait. Yeah, sure. I make a motion to approve re resolution 23-05 card. You might have to wait. Oh. Okay. I'm trying to get out of it. Not to be bossy. <laughs> Hold that thought. You made a motion to approve. Is there a second? Second. Let's move to second. Any discussion? Uh, and I just was going to ask the reason we chose, can you just go over again why we chose this bank? I, mean, as I, I chose, yeah, this program because uh, they're associated with um, my professional organization, the Association of School Business Officials. Um, <clears throat> and so it's sort of been a program that's embedded by school districts and finance departments across uh, really half of the nation, because about 25 states are in. Um, I was first exposed to it when I was working in Washington, um, working the Washington Association of School Business Officials sort of partnered with this. Um, sure. And it's just, <clears throat> there's nice tools with it. They have integration where the statements that if you want to really get more savvy than we were at Lakeland, where um, the reconciliation of the card, you can set up accounts for staff to actually go have to reconcile their statement, and you can take that data and actually upload it into your fiscal system. So they built some of those tools and integrations to try to save some of the paperwork. Mm -hmm. I didn't get there at Lakeland, but there's, um, it, it, they just sort of tailored the program for organizations and entities more than just going to Umpqua Bank and getting a P card or our credit card. So you feel this is better for transparency as well? Is that accurate? I, yeah, well, yes, I think the purchasing with whether we use a check or a credit card, I, I think in this day and age, we can have the same transparency. Um, the challenge right now is it's difficult to use checks and cash as you used to. Mm -hmm. There's many companies now that will not take a, a purchase order. Um, you know, which is sort of, that's just the, the nature of, of where things are going. And so a, a lot of when we first used it was that, well, how can we ease the burden on staff as they're doing travel? Well, if we're trying to make purchases, um, you know, quickly, even for maintenance department, um, or others where they get things but still have the same controls on our on our purchasing. So <clears throat> everywhere, when we have the cards out, they can't just go spend. They still have to put in a purchase order yeah. right. to get prior approval to use the <laughs> card for, yes. yes. Income. And so we have that and then monthly, then when they turn in their receipts and their statements, you know, each purchase is associated with the purchase orders that approved so the account code that is with that program is getting charged appropriately, and we can tie back <coughs> the receipts to the um, to the approval. And I have one other question: How many do we envision starting with of these P cards in our district? We'd start off slow. I think we'd start first with the departments: transportation, food service, yeah. district office, and sort of uh, test it out. Then we'd probably go to the high schools next because they really have the biggest need with the travel and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, at Lakeland, I had over 50 out okay. at one time. Um, so we'll roll out as... Yeah, as we'll have to start. And this is the first step, because this is, they asked the resolution to enter into the program. Um, then we have an application we have to go through, and then you, there's some setup with there, and by the time with some of the things we have going, um, with some improvements with our fine, uh, the next version of the fiscal system, and with September coming, I, I don't think this will start day one in September. Um, it'll probably be phased in throughout the school year. And you can keep us surprised as, as it rolls and gains a little. I don't. Moment. It's, it doesn't have to do with choosing up the bank. We're yeah. choosing the program, which is very widely used in the United States. The program chooses the bank, which they have partnered with for a long, long time. Yeah, so, I could, um, there's a lot of information 
on this program. I can uh, <coughs> share with Kelly the, some of the links of where they have that have a lot of information on that's really at the Illinois ASBO site that has a lot of information on the program. If trustees, as we go along, do have some further questions, we can run those through uh, yep. Dr. Meyer or Kelly and say, hey, can I get a little more information? So we have a motion on the floor, and I'll hear a call for a vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? Any abstain? Aye. One abstain. And that motion passes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, let me go to, back to my agenda, sorry. Okay, so we have a second reading of policy with the family engagement. This is incorporating So the second uh, reading, I just had a comma, I think this early yeah, class that we needed to get in oh, yeah. Okay, I'll hear a motion. <laughs> motion for the comma. <coughs> apostrophe, I think. It's apostrophe. Yeah. Apostrophe. Um, I make a motion to approve policy 2420-501 family engagement. A second. It's moved and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 That motion passes. And I'm going to move on to second reading of policy 3305, prohibition of tobacco use. You saw that there was a change in. We're just adding the use of nicotine. nicotine. Yep. I'll hear a motion for that one. I make a motion to approve 3305 prohibition of tobacco and or nicotine prohibition use. Second. We've been seconded. Any discussion? <coughs> All in favor? All right. All right, that motion passes. We do have a couple of uh, first reading of policies. There's four of them here. They are all new. And we've had a chance to look them over. So let's just move into, is there anyone facilitating these? Or we're just going to look at them and open for questions. Sure. And I can <coughs> certainly do the first one. Brian can do the second one. Kelly can do oh, the third perfect. one. So we kind of, if you have questions. Yeah. Sure, and we'll start with policy 3081. <laughs> is the new policy, it's in response to change in legislation. Are there questions? Yep, yeah, we're open for questions, discussion. Okay. Uh, I'll start. Yep. I, uh, I like the policy for the most part, I had a um, concern, maybe a possible addition to it. I was I, I texted Kelly and I was just trying to find out if we had a policy already in place for um, state law 336203, the Fairness in Women's Sports Act that was passed in 2020. Uh, and I, I don't know if we have one that reflects that. So, uh, unless I'm wrong. So I need an update on what that policy is. The policy, or, or the, the state law. The state, yeah. It's basically, well, I mean, I have it right here. Um, interscholastic, intercollegiate, intramural, and club athletics. Teams or sports that are sponsored by public primary or secondary school, public institution, higher education. Uh, in, or any school or institution whose students or teams compete against the public school or institution of higher education shall be expressly designated as one of the following based on biological sex, males, men or boys, females, women or girls, or co-ed or mixed. So it, the, the state law basically says men have, or boys have to play men or boys sports. Right. Women in women's yeah. sports. There's no jumping over crossing that line in athletics. And this has been in for almost three yeah. years now. But how does that impact this? Well, my concern with this policy that we're looking at here is just could we add some type of wording that also reflects that state law um, that's been on for three years. Because this, this policy we have here, 33081, doesn't address athletics at all, like playing in sports on teams. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. And I would, 
I, I know what you're saying a little bit. This is about um, facilities yes, and changing. changing facilities, so it's a, not the exact place it would be referenced. If or we do a whole other policy. Well, right. Which I almost. Be, which I I asked you about that I believe a few weeks ago. We did. We talked about it, and um, in our policies that deal with our athletics specifically. I'm a little bit struggling on where that fits because this is this policy is really about our own students and what you're addressing is when we play other students. Oh, well, no. This state law is our students, it's our our teams. Right, but if there's I hear what is it 6601? The state law? The one that you just read. 6203. 33-6203. Fairness and Women's Sports Act. So, yeah, so I think it would need to be a different because this is 6601 through 6606. Mm -hmm. So I feel like um, I could bring a first read of that to the board in July, uh, but I don't think it should be in here because it's not. I don't think they should overlap because. That's fine. Yeah, just I, you're I addressing guess, it and it's about yeah. what teams we, well, we that should play. Be that they, in. Yes. Yeah. This, this actually doesn't address my concern that I have with you. This yeah. that I'm reading here is the state law is purely biological sex playing in the correct sport. Correct. Right. right. And if we have to do a whole other policy to reflect this, then I'd be fine with me. Yeah. I, my my thought was, do we roll them together and make one policy? Well, we definitely need a different. Personally, I don't. I like the idea of having two policies. Like this is very clear on bathrooms, right. changing rooms. What is, what is law, what is what is allowed. Yeah. And that, that to me reaches a very broad, that reaches everybody. Um, mm -hmm. the, the biological sex in activities participation, mm -hmm. that to me is another, like obviously very, very important topic to right. be discussing and figuring out. Um, and I think we can keep them separate. Okay. Because they're both, both very important to make sure that we so you have the yep. you have the code that yep. mm -hmm. Jalen referenced. Yep. So we'll bring that forward in July that's as great. possible first reading. Then I won't talk about yeah. that part anymore. Yep. No, that but that's a no. That's a good point. A good point. Yeah. Is there other questions on the way this one's worded or second? <laughs> Just look at a pearly. I, I did read through it and I did not see any. I suppose. Grammar errors, misspelled words. Excellent. Queen. <laughs> the first one? Yeah. Um, are there other questions on the manner in which this is drafted? I think it's completely self explanatory. So we'll move on to the first reading of policy 7440 district credit cards. I know you said Brian could address questions we might have on that, but we won't make you jump up to the podium unless anything comes up. <clears throat> Straight forward. Were there any concerns, questions? Um, this this is basically just a policy to re reflect what we just discussed with P cards, right? Well, these are credit these cards, are credit so this cards. is a different. P cards oh. are not. They're a procurement card, but not a we. It, it, they're a little different. We do have a district credit card, and we didn't have a policy right. for those Address guidelines. So, so our P card is probably not covered under this policy. Then? I do not believe so, but that should we add that, or is that worth trying to make that part of this? Then oh, that's a good point. Like Brian, credit maybe cards roll and them right up and address that. Credit cards and the word for recruitment card. I mean, if they're technically different, that's a loophole. Maybe it's should we add that wording to here? <coughs> yeah. I've with uh, Trustee Peters that, you know, this probably just the title of what was made before P cards became really sort of widespread and so it would be a better title just for your okay. credit cards and that, that slash or however you want to do that, right, to edit. Let's do that so yeah. that it's yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Good call. Okay. So we'll move on to the next reading. 
And we'll look. This is a point of information. We oh. also have a bunch of charge cards. We might want to even include that. Walmart and like oh. check out the oh, yeah. specific like that. Yes. Yeah. They Where have you have like, an account and then like a Home Depot and things yeah. like that. Yeah. yeah, it would sort of cover all those bases. Okay, well that will require right. a little extra drafting. And we'll have see if Sorry. Wallace read it over. Oh look, I think most of those might be even credit cards now. Right. So some of this is housekeeping to try to get our policy up to speed. Yeah. Um, but then also okay. have it cover us. Moving forward. Yeah. Okay. We'll just see if I'll walk or read it over and do it, and then you guys will get it ahead of time to look at it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and uh, maybe if, if I'm missing it, someone pointed out to me, do we need to put anything about what um, Brian was saying about the filling out the POs still, even though they're able to use the credit cards, they still have to do that part, or is that not really well, well, purchase orders, or that would just be procedural. Okay. So that's not good. And, and it does say the use of credit cards is not intended to circumvent the district's policy. Policy on purchases. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Thank you for, for helping me find that. Yeah, no. Yeah, but then, no, I think that's important, actually. That, yeah. That yeah. Okay. Uh, then Thanks. we're going to look at a Sorry. new policy, 8600 record management. So, so what is, um, what's the, do we have a vault in our Yes, we do. And we follow many of the procedures that are outlined per this policy. We just didn't have a policy that existed. Where's the vault? There's one at LPO. Oh, uh, this is a secret. At LPO, and there's one at the district office. Oh, I but didn't even the know. The reason that we're bringing this up is that um, this district records here, if you can look down here, we are working to move um, several records into paper lists that will be in perpetuity, perpetuity electronically. And we put this into place in my last school district, um, and then it's all in writing. And we didn't, when I asked Kelly about it, she said, well, we don't have it in this district, so that's why we're bringing this forth. Okay. And so the 8600 records management fell in line with our, the next policy. Which is the retention. Is yes, the retention. This. And it outlines all of the... Yes. And we just didn't have it in this district, and so I okay. really needed to get this in there as we're moving to paperless, electronic um, record. Okay. Yeah. Um, so you can see there's a lot there, but there's this is a all lot, the law. And as some of it goes electronic... So a prime example would be binders and binders and binders and minutes. Mm -hmm. Right. I can scan all those and house those electronically, and then I can destroy those. That's what I was going to ask. Do we have a, do we have a plan? Like, are we actually just going to phase out over seven years, or are we going to scan what we have and then get rid of it now? We're starting now okay. to keep everything electronically. And, um, technology. We've been working with technology and facilities to do it, mm -hmm. and then we will work forward from this point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She has some minutes that are still on VHS. That we're well, going to most importantly is we have anything, <laughs> anything that was recorded becomes permanent record at the right. board meeting. Those are all on VHS tape still. And I had an entire cabinet full of VHS movies. So we are going, it will cost a little bit of money to transfer all those digitally because those then become, those are permanent record. I have to keep them, but they're on VHS. Yeah. So, and there's a lot. Because oh. you're the young one. Um, are there other questions on this? This is first reading. This is your opportunity to ask. We made some. You made some good comments on the first two. So, is there anything else you want addressed on these? These are sort of combined. It just seems like a lot. There's a lot of information to say, like what we already kind of know. I know. The right way. And it's a big document. It is huge. Yeah. And I will I will have put in a disclaimer on I read it all, but I'm not sure whether I caught nothing or there was nothing in there. <laughs> You're not going on record as, lottery, as giving it the so stamp of approval. <laughs> okay. It is all required by law, just so you know. Right. That's why it's yeah. written that way. Um, yep. Okay. All right. Well with that we will move on in our agenda.
to announcements. Announcements, anyone? Um, I just want to thank the board and everyone who came up for graduation and that the rains didn't come down until after everything was cleaned up, so that was fantastic. Miracle. Um, just to let you know, our amazing office um, coordinator and group has a plan in place to reach out to families for pre-registration who haven't gotten there yet, so we have a lot that we're still doing at this point in the year. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. I would love to say thank you from the teaching and learning team. Today was officially the first day of summer for our certificated staff, and between 25 and 30 K-5 math teachers were at the district office for a kickoff training for Eureka Math Squared new curriculum that you approved. Wanted those teachers guys for summer had an overview and the energy was really super positive. Oh. So thank you again for supporting updated math um, curriculum for our team. And paved because they spent uh, uh, over thirty thousand dollars for the manipulatives, which are those hands-on yeah. learning that our students K five will have. And it was so important to those teachers today. And you should have seen this was volunteer. They came after school was out to the district office, and it was like one hundred and two degrees in there. They had fans going, and the I mean, we should have done HVAC for our training facility, but we aren't. Um, so thank you to Andrea for writing that grant, and to all of the people that were there. Jen Majors from Northside, do you have anything that I do? I, I guess my biggest announcement is that I completed my first year as a champion, so that's Yay. a big deal. <laughs> Thank you. And I um, just really enjoyed the last week of school. Northside has a lot of um, traditions that they do for each day. They feel different, and it was neat to experience um, and visit with people who have gone to school there, grandparents who were visiting during field day, and a lot of um, community members who a lot of history at that school and I got to visit with those people and be part of that for the last week. So that's my biggest note. <laughs> <laughs> Sherry Hatley's from Hope. Oh, she was hiding. Hiding. Hello. Um, I just want to say thank you for um, supporting all of our schools for this school last year. And um, looking forward to the new math curriculum for sure. That is definitely exciting. And then um, just looking forward to next year and with our new open enrollment law and just you know tackling each hurdle as it comes and with the support for our school office staff because it really it really was quite a load and um, hope staff as well one person <laughs> is tackling those phone calls and reaching out to parents and, and we definitely want to get them registered. Yeah. Do you have any? Okay. All right. So I'll hear a motion. I would like to make a motion that we move into executive session as provided for in Idaho Code Title 74, Section 206, Subsection 1B, to consider the evaluation, dismissal, or disciplining of, or to hear complaints or charges brought against a public officer, employee, staff member, or individual agent, or public school student. Second. Moved and seconded. Roll call vote. Roll call vote. Trustee Peters? Yes. Trustee Sherman? Yes. Trustee Decker? Yes. Trustee Williams? Aye. Chair Lewis? Aye, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Motion passes. Thank you. All right, so we're now in executive session. Thank you, everybody who stuck it out.